It's the most obnoxious time of the year. Around this time, people from your family tree are most likely planning on stopping by just to have some hearty chats or to just share that Christmas spirit. Or you could be spending that time watching some guy talk about Tom and Jerry, but hey, there's no shame in that. So why this one and not Tom and Jerry and the Wizard of Oz? Well, that's actually a pretty good question, but what isn't a good question... Your butter is that. Do you ever get introduced to another property thanks to a form of media you're already familiar with showing it to you? Well, for me, that was with Tom and Jerry the Nutcracker tale introducing me to the Nutcracker. The Nutcracker isn't just a toy with a worryingly crippled jawline, but a story, the Nutcracker and the Mouse King turned into a play. A ballet, specifically. I had actually considered reading the original novel and looking into a couple of plays just so that I could maybe make a couple of comparisons until I realized this is Tom and Jerry in the Nutcracker tale. There are going to be many heavy alterations, alright? Are they gonna include bleeding swords, a candle, and seven gold crowns? Man, who could forget those bastardly directed DVD Tom and Jerry movies, each produced by Turner Entertainment and Warner Bros. Animation, generally considered to be fairly solid films, except for when the studio snapped in 2010 and thought they should start meeting some kind of yearly quota. Tom and Jerry meet Sherlock Holmes, Tom and Jerry and the Wizard of Oz, Tom and Jerry Robin Hood and his Sherry Mouse, Tom and Jerry's Giant Adventure, Tom and Jerry the Lost Dragon. What even is this? Tom and Jerry Spy Quest, Tom and Jerry Back to Oz, and Tom and Jerry Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. That last one is just Tom and Jerry placed next to a title of a pre-existing film. Now these were the films that were met with online mockery and people generally wondering what these studios are really doing with the cat and mouse duo. It's like nobody wanted to see him finally retire. However, one thing was certain. This whole thing worked really well on little kids, specifically those that were looking for anything ridiculously fast-paced with Tom and Jerry in it. And I would know because I happened to be one of them at one point. I remember getting so excited over the Wizard of Oz Tom and Jerry... and begged my parents to get it for me when it was available via pay-per-view so that I can watch it over and over again. You know, me making fun of my sister for watching Romeo and Juliet dozens of times in a row is starting to sound plenty hypocritical in retrospect. For those that don't know what pay-per-view is, I used to think that it was this. But it's actually where you basically pay on cable TV for a single movie to marathon until your free trial on it would expire. I recall this lasting somewhere between 8 to 24 hours. It was actually not need to pay a fee for every time you wanted to rewatch it, or at least that's what I assumed it meant at the time. I look back on the fact that I loved this film so much as a kid and think now, what exactly is my problem? Anyway, on Cartoon Network during the holiday season, The Nutcracker Tale would premiere a handful of times. I do remember watching it and probably liking it at some point. Fast forward 14 years later, and I rediscovered the Nutcracker via Spotify, and while it isn't necessarily what I listen to for the most part... We're learning about Korea, then I have diarrhea... Dear God, does it hold up. And here is a CD I ordered to show off in this video, and then put away for the rest of time. So for this Christmas season, I have here a considerably shorter video than whatever the usual around here might be. If you guys want a three hour long analysis video on Tom and Jerry the Nutcracker Tale, you're gonna have to look elsewhere, unfortunately, although something like that probably shouldn't exist. But I will, alas, have a longer, more ambitious video in the works soon, so stay tuned for that. Anyway, sit back, ready yourself a hot cocoa and a heated blanket of your choice as we take a look at Tom and Jerry and the Nutcracker Tale. Spoiler warning, there are better times to spend your Christmas season. This is kind of off script, but I just think it's funny how, you know, you have this sleeve and then you like pop the, food, the film out and it's just, it, it's just, it's literally just the, the box art. I'm not going to be able to make this last. Fun fact, I ordered the so-called special edition of this film not knowing what it was and it packs the night before Christmas from 1941, oh that's nice, as well as Santa's little helpers from October of 2014, which is probably bad. But the main focus of this video is still the Nutcracker tale in case you went from the comfort of your own home to Owasso, Oklahoma in the span of just a few minutes. So we start things off with the logo of the company that just about threw an entire movie away for a tax write-off and... Tom and Jerry becoming frozen solid. All right, movie's over, bye guys. I'm not sure what it is about this opening sequence, but I've noticed how the track March has a tempo increase that is just a so 
slight paired with shots that go by really quickly without letting anything sit makes my heart increase by five. This movie is about 48 minutes long, so I think that explains plenty. It's probably just a me problem, but that all happened within 20 seconds, and I'm not a fan. Ick. It's only like less than a minute in, and this is already the scariest movie I've ever watched. Alright, cue the musical about the cat dictator overlord that eats everyone's rations. Yeah, and guess what? You're not gonna be his ruler. Jerry is now putting on a pouty face of sorts because he has to wait next year for the performance he loves so dearly to play out once more. Nothing for Jerry in this empty place except his love of the ballet. Guys, trust me, this can all work out between a rat and a pair of legs. If only he could dance. I often wonder if I should keep my criticisms of the movie's pacing to myself if mine aren't that much better. Hmm. Well, Tuffy over here just loves violence. So here's the inexplicable magic that gives Jerry this suit, but remember... We cannot question anything that takes place. This is a kid's movie, after all. Now Jerry can actually dance, and this scene admittedly made me giggle a little bit because Tuffy was staring off into space like, yeah, I do that too sometimes. Bravo, bravo. Oh yeah, I forgot that he talks, and I hope I'm not required by law to like his voice. The writers then remember that the Nutcracker actually begins with Miniature Overture, followed by the toys near the Christmas tree coming to life. So who's behind- <clears throat> Yep, you're right. Uh, okay, yeah, uh, not- yeah, not the target demographic. Your head still came off, so apologies for being rightfully skeptical. And look, the whole couple thing, they made it work after all. Here's another live beheading. And just like that, an entire kingdom is formed, with a feast and all. Who's ready for conflict? A door magically opens, exposing Tom to the succulent side of a chicken, which of course piques the interest of all the rest of the cats. Also, I'm not sure if this is yet another hot take from the guy Goron. 200, but I find this whole art style to get kind of eh. Sometimes when I look at the faces of particularly the cats and mice, their faces all look like they're gonna melt away, and attempts at slapstick fall short when characters can end up looking like this. The slapstick in the original cartoons never looked gross, but here it is! And so the cats ransack everything, as everyone except Cherry flees to that one patch of snow. And so the toys all get captured. Tom ruins a perfectly good feast, beats Tuffy over the head with a chicken, and then Jerry and Ballet Lady, voiced by Tara Strong. I don't remember this character's name, I don't think it was ever explained. Jerry then enacts a plan to free the imprisoned toys, and it seems to be going well for him. Meanwhile, the king yells at some ashes and sends Tom out to stop them, where he is triumphant by mistake. What could those felines do without Spences? While our heroes are trapped, they get shot out of a cannon and end up traveling so far they end up back in the snow. Goodbye, barrier of entry. If it wasn't terribly obvious by now, the entire kingdom has been taken over by the cats and the toys are their prisoners, obligated to do their bidding. Like this doll who's crying because she looks like an onion. Take a hike, Tim. Close enough. He will never give up. You can't give up yet. Yeah, he can't give up now because the whole kingdom is at stake. We, we won't want want anything, anything bad, bad happening, to, happening it. to it. Get out of my house. I live here. And there's, there's nothing, nothing to do, do about, about it. it. Now no, please, please leave. leave. No, no, I asked, I asked first. first. I'm, I'm just as capable of calling the cops as you are. Why well, all we need is a great idea. But it looks like the pull string horse, whose name is Nelly, voiced by Kathleen Barr, who's most notable for her roles in the Frogger games on GameCube. I can only talk if someone gives my string a pull. I was thinking, we need someone to aid us. And? The scene honestly made me kind of mad because the first thing she did was say that she can only talk when her string is pulled. Could they not see this string go back in? Why are they just staring at her awkwardly? Pull the string! Nellie points out the tag of the company or individual that made them, inspiringly named Toy Maker, and how they could use their help. <laughs> Those tags weren't there in the last two shots. Being prompted to pitch in with his idea, Jerry makes a connection to the star on the tags and the star in the sky. Follow the star? Now I guess that's worked before! Did this entire movie already play out when I wasn't looking? Yeah, so that's basically your run-of-the-mill point A to point B, but there's conflict here in their kids' movie. It's truly got it all. The king then expresses how the mouse trio is likely still alive out there, so he sends Tom after them to make sure they're really dead. <gasps> Murdered a kids' movie?! 
I was gallivanting that I would see a pit and fall inside. But if you think he was gonna go about this alone, you'd be mistaken. He's an idiot, not an imbecile. He gets his troops and they ready their corks. Yeah, that won't only knock them out where they proceed to wake up an hour later. Did I mention there's already a neighborhood of cats living here and basement chickens? Anyway, he's sent by Ballet Lady to warn Jerry and Co. about the upcoming attack orchestrated by Tom. Like, you can tell he's excited to lead like this, in similar fashion to me being excited to do this. Just be completely sure that you don't brush up against the motion detection lasers on your way to the stash. Watch that. <laughs> I've always wanted to say that. Hold it. Watch this. Oh, hello, narrator. I didn't know you existed. Looks like Tom is carving a path straight to Jerry. In other words, we're never gonna find out what any of this means. Back to Jerry and the companies, they stumble upon a force that of course they traverse, how else do we make it interesting? Divorce papers. Also, I forgot to be fair and mention that Polly the Elf, apparently that's his name, is voiced by Ian James Curlett. Okay, moving on. I might find the faces of most of the characters look pretty hideous, but for a direct-to-DVD short film with probably less of a budget, I've got to say that not only is the animation still quite lively and expressive, but I'm really digging the lighting, especially in this scene. I'm just saying that they absolutely could have sheeped out with this film, but they didn't, and I commend them for that. That is also the scene I remember most. Most likely because Nutcracker and Marie Depart for the Pine Forest is my favorite track on the entirety of the Nutcracker, but it's not on this version. <laughs> I lied to my audience, here it is again. Jerry then gets carried away while showing off, falls down a frozen waterfall and sinks all the way down to some seaweed or something that wraps around his foot, and it all seems pretty hopeless. But the track named Nutcracker and Marie Depart for the Pine Forest is almost over, boys. Wrap up the conflict, okay? Up next, we have what I consider the funniest scene in the whole movie. Ballerina woman starts pulling the keys towards her, leading the king to think it's all just a little game. The king's assistant calls her out on it without actually realizing in time that she wants to escape. And therefore, she's handed the keys. Once he realizes what he's done, he pilfers, my favorite word in the dictionary, the keys. But of course, Ballerina Girl already has just the key she needs. The film begs you not to question how she figures this out so quickly. And well, it looks like the cat's pretty much caught up to the Harry gang. Sorry guys, you didn't actually die of hypothermia. I know you wanted to hear some good news today. The then Tuffy, who'd been tagging along the whole trip, starts acting as Tom's conscious, trying to convince him not to hurt the Harvey crew? Wouldn't it not be a mouse, but another cat? I was about to brush this entire scene off as I question what the actual point of it was, and it probably was not for this visual gag alone. Until he says... Sometimes the conscience must take drastic measures. And drastic measures, no doubt. But not only was he a good enough distraction, but this maneuver caused the whole cat tower to topple, buying enough time for Tuffy to make it to the Jerry Garcias before they can. Polly then realizes that part of him is coming undone because of the exposure to water, since he's an ornament, not a toy. Oh, we have to put a stop to that. I had an aunt who started to unravel. <laughs> is this your grandpa? Tuffy finally gets to warn our heroes about the cat attack and arrives shortly after to the scene they do. I don't like how this tree looks, it looks like tar. So mentally unwell squirrels attack him for the acorns Jerry threw under the tree, leading him to go through a wood chipper. And this right here is single-handedly the worst frame in the entire movie. When I said that it feels like the inspiration for these kinds of outcomes were inspired by Gross Out, this is what I mean! This is horrific! This looks like something that would loom over my shoulder at night. <laughs> I genuinely hate it. Anyway, they're surrounded now, and they hatch an insane plan that ends up actually working. And uh-oh, they're headed to a Christmas tree farm. That's gonna make it really difficult for the cats to find them. That doesn't sound much like a mouse to me. <laughs> and what kid's adventure movie would be complete without some kind of dragon encounter? Oh. That's a lot. Polly lost his head, but not to fear. Some... Conventionally attractive flame fairies show them where the exit is and help Polly get his head back. So that's one of the two predicaments that's gotta be taken care of. Also, 
this face. There's nothing important about it, it's just a face, but look at it. And one of the dragons awaken, Jerry and Tuffy look like they shattered a vase that was given to a couple as a wedding gift, and two seconds later, Jerry is already putting his plan to motion, man! Yeah, we gotta make sure the dragon, who is in fact part rattlesnake, as you can see here, that's why it can be hypnotized, isn't able to breathe during this process of doing their bidding. Yeah, just don't forget that it's still, in fact, still suffocating, and it will die, and you're just letting it die, you radicate. Up next is... Instant Karma, where Tom literally lands a clean shot on everyone, but of course, survive. And they don't even try to explain how. Anyway, Tom ends up in a haunted house and gets crushed by a giant mechanical bird. Let's keep it rolling. Then we go back to the ballerina who is about to free herself, but then the king reiterates that the only way to play his stupid game is with the string, and that's the whole scene. Maybe this will make sense later, but for now... Eh. All right, into the carnival we go, and oh goody, my favorite, the misogynistic carnival. Okay, but seriously, I hope this kind of joke has become obsolete now. It sucks! Also, baby girl is meant to be more insulting than just girl? Makes so much sense. Then Tom and Jerry, like the best buds they are, destroy the entire carnival with part of the roller coaster tracks. I hate misogyny, so I collapse as I kick my feet in the air like a small child. They then encounter quite the cliff, leading to the crew blowing on some balloons, and away they go. They don't have much control over where, so who knows where they'll go. Thinking quick, Tom dresses up as a copyright claim, except he really isn't because Batman would never climb into a cannon and blow himself up. But then this cat actually serves as a threat and impales Nellie's balloon with a crossbow bolt, sending her all over the place. Whoa, Nellie! Technically, this is the first time that she's mentioned by name. In the form of a pun. Talk about holding on by a thread. Will you shut up? Nellie makes a recovery and gets chased down by the cats. Jerry grabs onto her string, but out of fear, Nellie forcefully makes Jerry let go. The cats obviously catch up to her, and now they need to figure out how to get her to speak. I think I can help you with that. Hello. And this... This is a very good expression. So the professor basically turns Nellie into a traitor by being able to pretty effortlessly extract just the right info out of her. They're off to see the toy maker. What's that all about? She didn't even try to wrestle with him or anything. Maybe because she assumed she'd be hurt in a drastic way or not be able to speak anymore? I don't know, because the scene goes by too fast. And in case you're too stupid to tell... She's a traitor now. She can't go back to her friends. They'll hate her. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that! Oh, using the string to get herself down safely. Okay, fine, I'm actually stupid. Are you happy now? But you guys don't want to be told what you already know. Just like the scene in the movie. How do I turn this thing off? And so they finally made it to the toy maker place. Oh, look, it's more conflict. Wait, wait, wait! I finally figured out why Tuffy's voice is slightly annoying! He's Fred! I've been following your adventures for longer than you know. Okay, so let me ask you this. How would you feel if your near-death experience was turned into a toy? I won't lie, dude. I think you're kind of weird. But he does also know about Nellie getting discouraged and how she believes they wouldn't want to see the Jeremys ever again. This is immediately resolved, because this is Tom and Jerry the Nutcracker tale. This movie has as about as much depth as a dent. So Polly gets a makeover, is not an ornament anymore, and intended for roughhousing now. Jerry is then told that if the sun rises because magic and more magic and something about magic, the kingdom will be under the grasp of the cats forever. He's given a key that allows him to take control of an entire army of soldiers that they will be using to take back the kingdom once and for all. <laughs> It all comes back to warning people. So the final battle commences and, I don't know, this just seems like it would boil down to being a nuisance. Nellie makes her triumphant return by smashing Tom's teeth with a hammer. You see, like, I just didn't really feel the impact of that one. Do you guys know what I mean? But also, about the whole being a nuisance thing. These toys are pretty threatening, so maybe they're onto something. As the infestation goes on and the sun continues to rise, Jerry hatches his master plan of driving a toy train into each of the cats, which drives outside of the set. Why didn't they just jump off prematurely? Why did that work? And what about the rest of the cats in the town? Did they just cease to exist? Whatever, everybody's happy now, and then, oh no, some debris collapses onto Nellie when she pushed Jordan and Billy Beat out of the way. And without a shadow of a doubt, 
This results in what is most likely the fastest I've ever seen a character get killed on screen and then revived. I tweeted this clip all the way back in early 2022 showing that this character dies and is brought back to life within 39 seconds. This feels like this wasn't actually supposed to happen, so then the magic is just like, Hold on, let me just... <laughs> it's like it didn't even happen. And she no longer needs her string pulled to speak and can do so freely because, uh, of course, she can. And that's it. That's the whole movie. Jimmy splurged on expensive cars with the remaining budget, and that's why they had to wrap up things up as soon as possible. Like a present. So yeah, that was Tom and Jerry the Nutcracker Tale. It's actually not bad. They did a decent job with the length that they gave themselves, and the pacing was also pretty consistent. I'm kind of in a predicament because I'm not really left with a whole lot to say now. This movie is pretty average. It doesn't do anything groundbreaking. It just exists because the Nutcracker is public domain and the quota for Tom and Jerry Christmas specials were just a perfect fit for this. And while there's a few things that go unexplained, if you're six, it's fine. This film kind of feels like mid-tier junk food. If there's nothing else around, why not? Am I right? It gets the job done. It's not great. It's not bad. It just gets the job done. <gasps> Wait! This wasn't supposed to be a review! Now how about we talk about the other bits of content in this special edition DVD, Santa's Little Helpers. Yeah, it was pretty alright. To finish things off, I rewatched The Night Before Christmas from 1941. And all I have to say is that this is classic Tom and Jerry at its finest. The only thing I don't like is how they made Tom sound like an actual cat and not just scream like a grown man like in the later episodes. But that includes the Tom and Jerry Nutcracker tale, just a little something that I wanted to put out there for this Christmas season. I just want to urge you once again, keep your loved ones close to you in any way you can. I'll have another video in the works that I'd say is on par with the stuff that I've made previously, but for now, I do want to take a little bit of a break. Also, I'm not going to wrap this up with a joke unless, you know, wrapping it up like a present is another dumb joke, although I've already made that joke. I just want to conclude this video by bidding a farewell to all of you, and Merry Christmas to those that celebrate it. See you around!